Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cardiac Wire show. My name is Jake Fishman. I'm the host of the show and the editor of the Cardiac Wire, and we have a great episode for you all today. Uh, we're going to be talking to Dr. John Rumberger, and we're talking about FFRCT, which has uh, had a huge impact on cardiology and cardiovascular imaging over the last, say, about five years. And we're going to take a deep dive into that, uh, how it's evolved, and how it's impacting practices across the globe. Uh, Dr. Rumberger, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I'm pleased to be here. I'm really happy to have you here. Um, just to start us all off, uh, I feel like a lot of folks already know you or know of you, but maybe you can share a little bit about uh, yourself and your practice and your background in cardiology. Yes, well, I'm a formally trained cardiologist who has been doing cardiac radiology for the past 40 years. Uh, so I started doing uh, cardiac CT back in the early 1980s using electron beam CT. And I've, of course, advanced on to multi-detector and other things like that. I've never looked back. Um, I just love and fascinated by uh, diagnosing heart disease with cardiac CT. I'm a former professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic uh, and at the Ohio State University. Uh, heretofore, uh, before joining Corazon Imaging, I spent 15 years at the Princeton Longevity Center in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, honing my skills, clinical as well as imaging skills. Um, I'm now medical director of Corazon Imaging. Um, and uh, uh, we're really bringing to the people cardiac CT. Uh, we have an ability using uh, mobile scanners. Uh, we have two scanners now. We'll have a third and a fourth one probably by the end of this calendar year. Uh, and we bring the technology to the patients, the referring physicians uh, in their offices, and uh, it's been spectacular. We've done uh, well over 2,000 scans uh, in the past eight or nine months, and we're shooting for more. That's amazing, and, and what a background. Those are some some big-name institutions you uh, spent some time at. Um, so I know you said you haven't looked back, but I'm asking you to look back real quick, uh, particularly around FFR measurements. Um, can you just, for folks maybe who uh, either they're they're well uh, introduced to it or maybe just being introduced to it, you can get, give us a feel for how FFR has evolved over the years and and into you know the last several years of FFRCT. It 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 really goes back to the catheterization laboratory, looking at the percent stenosis where you would use that information to determine if the patient had uh, potential for obstructive disease with the advent of uh, angioplasty and then stents. This has been something that has been the forefront for uh, cardiac imaging in the cath lab. Now, what's turned out though, is that it turns out that stenosis visually between 40 and 90%, uh, the ability to look at the actual physiologic flow becomes somewhat of a conundrum. And as a result, Cath Lab has developed the techniques using fractional flow reserve, which basically looks at a lesion and the pressure gradient across that. And if that pressure gradient, let's say the pressure is 100 millimeters before the lesion and 80 millimeters after the lesion, there's a 20 millimeter pressure drop, or the fractional flow reserve becomes 0 0.8, which is the level at which we think this probably is hemodynamically significant. So that's something that the cath lab has evolved over the years. Along comes cardiac CT and its ability to look at the entire spectrum of coronary artery disease from no disease to early plaque to late plaque to plaque composition. But the Achilles heel of cardiac CT is that you visually overestimate the severity of the stenosis. So it turns out that with cardiac CT, you end up having a very sensitive ability to look for obstructive disease, but the specificity is moderate. Um, what's transpired though, is that people have then learned how to duplicate 
FFR in the CT lab, FFR-CT, which allows you to now not only look at the physical characteristics of plaque from beginning to end, but also allows you to look now at the physiologic applications and using the same techniques, the same validations that have been provided for the past 20 years in the cath lab, we can do the same thing now in the with the cardiac CT lab without additional radiation. Uh, the patient doesn't really have to know what's going on because we send it for advanced image processing. Really interesting. And, um, you know, the, the, the overestimates that you're talking about, that's like to have that just be a fact of life for so many years and then to be able to do it more accurately and less invasively is... Um, that that's that has been a game changer for me. I like I said, I've been involved with cardiac CT for many, many years, but I really, you know, I knew about FFRCT, but I never had the chance to practice it. So with the advent of Corazon imaging and the whole thing, we now have access to that. And I would say 30 to 40 percent of the patients that we are sent clinically. Uh, need to go on to have FFRCT, anywhere between 40 and 90% stenosis, which is consistent with the guidelines from the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology. So before you dev or, um, adopted FFRCT, what, what would happen with these patients? Well, we would, we would say, looks like a serious stenosis, and uh, they go to the cath lab, and the cath lab would say, mm, not so much. Right. And so a lot of a lot of issues. But now we can send the patients and really say, listen, this patient has potentially inducible ischemia proven by physiologic measurements, and that this patient should have catheterization. That also helps the cath lab person because they know which vessel and what area to really um, expect there might be a problem. And also it allows you to look at multi-vessel disease. So let's say that there's a serious lesion in the left anterior descending and sort of a moderate lesion in the right coronary. By doing FFRCT, we can look at both and then help direct the cath lab to say, this lesion in the right coronary doesn't look like it's hemodynamically significant, but the one in the LED, and this is where you need to focus. Right, so it's it's more, it allows your, your partners in the cath lab to be you know, more targeted, more yeah. confident. So a lot of things, getting getting catheterization approved sometimes for planned uh, stent placement and things like that uh, involves sometimes many uh, situations are that they require the cardiac CT with FFR before you start talking about stents. Right. Do you have any um, specific patient cases that, you know, are um, particularly interesting or worth discussing? Yes, I have a couple um, I'd like to show you. So here, here I'm going to show you two examples. This is a patient uh, that we had examined uh, using uh, uh, our cardiac CT scanner. And you could see here in the left anterior descending, there was a, probably a 30 40% stenosis. But further down, you can see this is what we call mixed plaque. That means that it's both non-calcified and calcified and sometimes can be potentially what we call high-risk plaque. Using the FFR in that area, you can see that the images look pretty terrific. That's very uh, good. And sometimes I'll actually use the images that are supplied to me by the FFR uh, to actually uh, look at the images of pretty much a good comparison here. But in this particular LAD, the value is 0 0.84, which rules out functional ischemia in this patient. So even though this is a relatively nasty lesion, this patient does not need to go to the cath lab and needs aggressive medical therapy. The next one here is showing also a left anterior descending. You can see a minimal stenosis here. There's a narrowing, and this is non-calcified plaque here and here with just a little partially calcified area. So again, this is what we consider high-risk plaque. But in this area, this looks like a relatively significant stenosis. And if we look at the FFR in that area, it is below 0 0.8, indicating functional ischemia. This can allow the person in the cath lab to then focus on this lesion, realize that it's relatively long, 
So if you're talking about stent placement and stent uh, planning, you're going to talk about a very long stent or perhaps two stents along the way. What would happen with these patients uh, without FFRCT in terms of clinical? Well, I think uh, uh, both of them would have been sent to the cath lab. Uh, the first patient, they would have called back and said, you know, you're full of crap. There's nothing, nothing bad about this patient. And this one, uh, they would say, hey, congratulations. So I'd be uh, uh, batting 50-50, and I'd rather do better than that. From a clinical impact, that's told an excellent story about how essentially – you and your partners are are clinically and your patients are clinically benefiting from taking this in from a, a technological process um you know how has that worked for you what have you done for you and your um technologists and physicians in terms of technology well, that, workflow that, first of all we we've hired incredible technologists to be able to do to take these pictures so we've done thousands of images so far and they really look terrific uh, they're excellent uh, with that, then we are able to directly send to uh, FFRCT. So with this situation, we're able to send directly from the workstation. That image processing is done by them remotely. They do geometric modeling. Uh, they take uh, principles of fluid dynamics, and they use statistical uh, learning technology to estimate blood flow and pressure and then give us back the information. I can send a, a request directly from the workstation, uh, and then it comes back to me uh, within 2 to 12 hours. Um, actually, this can be done within minutes. They've showed, shown that, but we're an outpatient facility, so we don't really need something back with, within a few minutes. Um, and with that, then uh, I get an email, I'm able to look at the images, I'm able to look at a 3D flow model and, and start learning of that and then incorporating that information into my final report. Okay, that's really interesting. And it's, um, you know, obviously forever in, in the world of cardiac imaging, technology has played a big role. And uh, having that doubt then I'm sure makes a world of difference for adopting FFRCT. Um, when we think about practices or or health systems who haven't adopted FFRCT yet. Do you have any advice for them to make sure that it's it's right for them and how to make sure that they're ready to do it successfully? Yeah, they have to, they have to be able, uh, one of the things that I have found is that our referring physicians, which are both cardiologists and primary care physicians, really appreciate the extra effort we make to make sure that we're talking about physiologic information. It allows us to be very comprehensive with the cardiac CT, again, looking from apples to, to, to zebras, looking for anything and also looking at physiology. It, 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 it really allows you to come up with a specific treatment plans. So this patient needs to be a stent. This patient looks like they have triple vessel disease probably going to need a, a bypass surgery. This patient does not have any disease, but he's got a high-risk plaque. You need to treat him X, Y, and Z. Uh, it provides a very convenient situation. Uh, it's turned out to be cost-effective, which is also very important. And it's wider acceptance by the physicians, uh, referring physicians, and the local cardiologists. So I think that if you really want to have a comprehensive cardiac CTA program, you really need to include the FFR CT in your practice. All right. Is there anything that they should do to, to make sure when they are adopting it that they do it the right yes. way? Yeah, you know, they, uh, uh, Heartflow would be glad to talk with you, and PIA would be glad to talk with you about the specifics of incorporating that in uh, incorporating FFRCT into your individual practice. Got it. Okay, great. Well, uh, Dr. Rumberger, thank you so much for sharing this. It's um, your your background is you know incredibly impressive in cardiac imaging. So the things that you have to say, um, you know, carry a lot of weight in terms of what FFRCT can do, uh, not just for your patients, but also for your partners and just the overall efficiency of uh, cardiology and cardiovascular workflows, um, which, you know, we all know there's room for more efficiency there um, and quality of care. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, for everybody who's watching, I hope you, you learned a thing or two about FFRCT and how it might impact you. And it seems like uh, Dr. Rumberger laid out a couple really straightforward ways to, to start your adoption of FFRCT. So go ahead, check out um, the different vendors that they talked about. And also if you're, uh, I guess, 
in the uh, regions that Corazon supports, feel free to reach out to Dr. Remiger and, and talk to um, him about how they might be able to become a outsourced imaging partner for, for you and your practice. Uh, thanks for dialing in, everybody, and catch you next time. <laughs>